like that. Starting today and for the next two consecutive Sabbaths, we're going to be studying the 1888 message, which Mrs. White defined as that most precious message, the righteousness of Christ. And I wanted to share with you the resource material that I used to put this PowerPoint presentation together. One of the books was Touch With This Feeling. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. Uh, J.R. Zakur. He's one of our theologians, retired, a Frenchman. It was originally written in French. It had to be translated. This is just on the humanity of Christ. And the humanity of Christ became a big issue in the Adventist church in the 19, starting in the mid-1970s, but especially the 80s and the 90s. Uh, about 15 years ago, I did make a four-point PowerPoint presentation on this book. So, But this is an excellent book, and I would strongly recommend it. It's well documented. Uh, Dr. Zakur, uh, in fact, a brand new uh, Seventh-day Adventist University in Madagascar carries his name. So, But this is one of the research uh, books that I use for this. The other one is, and this is what I even recommend more, Return of the Latter Rain. Anybody ever hear this book? It's uh, by Ron Duffield. It's a very systematic, very methodical written book. Uh, it gives you a good feel for the 1888 General Conference in Minneapolis and what happened. Uh, so I would strongly recommend this book. And then the Holy Grail is the 1888 material. Anybody ever hear of this? In 1988, at the centennial of the 1888 General Conference session in Minneapolis, the E.G. White released this. There's four volumes, uh, and absolutely everything that Mrs. White had to say about 1888 are in these four volumes. Like I said, everybody quotes from these, and these other two authors that I uh, just presented here use this. But this is the material that we're going to be using this morning in our study. And as you can see, this is part two. We had part one one year ago. It was last July. Do you remember the message? <laughs> it's easier to be saved than to be lost because you are already saved. And that's what Jones and Wagner presented in 1888. And, of course, Mrs. White backed them, and she recognized it to be truth. Uh, and one of the main texts that they used was Romans chapter 5 and verse 18, because of one man's disobedience or sin, we all inherited condemnation. We all inherited a nature that God has already condemned. But even so, or in the same way, because of one man's righteousness, Jesus, God has saved the whole world. Now that doesn't mean he's saving them for eternity. Uh, that's the teaching of universalism, which is a heresy. But God, because of what Jesus did on Calvary's cross, he became the Savior of everyone. And as 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10 says, but especially of those who believe, those who accept it. So Jesus, what he, he did on the cross, his righteous works is actually imputed to every human being. And that's the good news we're supposed to be bringing to the world. You know, that God loves you, he died for you, stop running away from him. Unfortunately, too many times, Seventh-day Adventists, we get the cart before the horse and we preach the things like the Sabbath or some other doctrinal issue, and those are the fruits of the gospel. That's not the gospel. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, the gospel is the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And that's what we're supposed to be bringing the, the world. And then to the believer, of course, the fruits of the gospel would be obedience to God's Ten Commandment law. But that's not even us doing it. It's the Holy Spirit doing it in us. So that was kind of part one, if you remember that. So you already have salvation. Before anybody can be lost, they must reject the salvation that Christ has already worked out for each and every one of them. So uh, we're going to get into part two. And before we do that, shall we bow our heads and have prayer? Our loving Father in heaven, Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would certainly be here, that he would lead and direct in this study this morning. May our eyes always be turned upon Christ, Father, 
We thank you so much for Jesus and everything he has done. Be with us now, I pray, and may Jesus be glorified, for we ask in his holy name. Amen. So that most precious message uh, that Mrs. White termed, we're going to start off with some words from Kenneth Wood. Does anybody know who Kenneth Wood is? He was an associate editor under Francis Nichols. If you ever used the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary, you've seen Francis Nichols' name because he was the editor, the chief editor. And you know if you ever used the Bible commentary, what a mantham job that was. It was just you as well. Kenneth Wood is one of our theologians, and he was associate director under Nichols, but he said this, while we review our history, we should remember that it is not for the purpose of finding fault in others, past or present, for the sake of tearing down, but rather that we might learn from their mistakes and not repeat them, that we may learn anew the death of the long forbearance of the mercy of God. This study we're going to have this morning, it's going to get kind of, it'll sound kind of derogatory, and it's certainly not meant to be that way, but we have to look honestly at the history um, at, of the church and, and what really happened in 1888. So it, it's not for, the, the intent is not putting down somebody or speaking derogatory. It's, the, it's we're after truth. Oops, I think I went. Okay, Jones and Wagner exalted the divinity of Christ. They saw him as self-existing, having life in himself, possessing by nature all the attributes of divinity. Wagner unequivocally proclaimed at the 1888 General Conference, we believe in the divinity of Christ. He is God. That may not sound very radical today, but in 1888 it was. Although a lot of our pioneers came in from the Methodist Church, and they were Trinitarians. There was a lot of them that came in from congr uh, congressional churches, and they were anti-Trinitarian. And uh, in fact, uh, in 1865, Uriah Smith wrote a book claiming that Jesus Christ was the first created being, but that he was created. And some of the other leaders of our church who did not believe in the Trinity, who believed Jesus was created, and you can see the list there, James White, Captain Joseph Bates, J.N. Andrews, um, R.F. Cantrell and J.N. Lothenborough. These were anti-Trinitarian, and they did not accept that Jesus was part of the Godhead. So when Wagner stood up in 1888 and said, we believe that God, Jesus is God, that was kind of a radical statement for that time for a lot of our leaders. And there was a lot of noise made over that. Mrs. White said, The fullness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ had been set forth among us with beauty and loveliness to charm all whose hearts were not closed with prejudice. And she said that in 1890. She recognized it was truth. In fact, Professor Forte from the seminary at Andrews at camp meeting last year, not this past one, but last year, he said that Jones and Wagner were the first two to truly identify accurately the person of Jesus Christ which is Christology, the study of who the person of Jesus was, that Jesus had two natures. He had the divine nature, who was fully God, and then he took man, human nature, and he took man's fallen nature. So, oops. Closely connected with their understanding of the divine nature of Christ was his human nature. To Jones and Wagner, in the same condition that men are in, whom he died to save. Now that was a pretty radical statement, even for then. But and it, I, I got to tell you right now that the humanity of Christ was not an issue at the 1888 General Conference session. Um, it was more a distraction, as was the law in Galatians. If you remember from part one of our study, you know, in, in Galatians chapter three and verse 24 it says, "Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ." that we may be justified by faith. But after that, the schoolmaster's done away with. And Wagner came along and says, well, that law is the Ten Commandment law. And of course, the Seventh-day Adventist, uh, Seventh Adventist position has always been that the schoolmaster in, in Galatians chapter 3 was a ceremonial law. And so when Wagner brought that up in 1886, actually, two years before the 
1888 conference, there was a lot of noise made, and the general conference president, G.I. Butler, he wrote a book called The Law and Galatian, which he distributed to all the delegates before the 1888 conference, where he claimed it was only the ceremonial law. And here you got Jones and Wagner saying, well, it's a Ten Commandment law. And they thought, horror of horrors, they're, they're trying to do away with the Ten Commandments. And of course, that was not the issue at all. If you remember from part one, I told you G.I. Butler was back in Battle Creek, Michigan. He, he was sick. He could not go to uh, Minneapolis in 1888. So he uh, had J.H. Morrison, who was president of the Iowa Conference. He delegated his authority to him. And J.H. Morrison got there before anybody else at, at uh, Minneapolis, and he wrote on a chalkboard, the Long Galatians is a ceremonial law, and he signed his name. And on the other side, he wrote, the Long Galatians is a moral law, and he wanted Wagner to go up and sign his name. Now, Wagner wouldn't do it. Not that he didn't believe that, but Jones and Wagner said, we didn't come to argue about the Long Galatian. We came to preach about the righteousness of Christ. And so there was already this issue going on between the leaders of the church, G.I. Butler and Uriah Smith. And, of course, most everybody out followed those two leaders. And they opposed Jones and Wagner uh, greatly, except for Mrs. White. There was a, out of the 90 delegates to the Minneapolis General Conference, less than 20 accepted the message of the righteousness of Christ by Jones and Wagner. So that means, and this is mostly your ministers, our conference workers, conference presidents and that, so that means out of that 90 people, almost 75% or 80% were under the control of Satan. And Mrs. White tells us that, and I'm going to share that with you in a minute. So this is a serious issue, and we need to understand this. So the humanity of Christ was not an issue. In fact, Ralph Larson, anybody ever hear of him? He was president of the BRI, the Bible Research Institute, uh, the Eastern Division in the Philippines. And in 1886, he wrote a book called The Word Made Flesh, where Elder Larson went to Angels University and he went to the E.G. White Estate. And he got all, everything he could get, what Seventh-day Adventist ministers were preaching, what we were writing in our articles and our magazines. And we were pretty much on the same page, and that was that Christ took the nature of Adam after the fall. That has always been a Seventh-day Adventist position. There was a few road bumps, and I'm going to share one with you, but during that time, but when Jones and Wagner got up there and they, they made or produced their, their theology off that, that was the basis of their theology, that Jesus had to take fallen, our fallen nature. He absolutely had to. Well, because of the disdain and dislike, and I would not be exaggerating if I said hatred for Jones and Wagner, they started bucking that and fighting them on that. But I want to uh, give you now what Jones and Wagner used the scripture, and they use many of them, but this is only one. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 16 through 18, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. The Greek word for seed there is spermatos, and we get sperm from that. Um, Wherefore in all things behold him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest, and the things pertaining to God to make reconciliations for the sins of the people. For in it that he himself had suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them or help them that are being tempted. In fact, in verse 17 there, if you look at that, that's another argument why Jesus had to take our sinful fallen nature because he could not be our high priest unless he did. And in Hebrews chapter 5, the, most of the chapters on that, the high priest had to be chosen from the people. So in order for Jesus to become our high priest, he had to take our sinful fallen nature. That's just another argument for it. But this is one of the texts that Jones and Wagner used. Uh, I'm going Here's one of the hiccups, and this is from the 1888 material, from the writings of Mrs. White. It says, letters have been coming to me affirming that Christ could not have had the same nature as man, for if he had, he would f have fallen under similar temptations. That is exactly the position that evangelicals take today. And it's a position that Dr. Walter Martin, uh, did you folks ever hear of him? Yeah, some, he was a Baptist theologian who in 1955 met with our leaders of the church 
And what they discussed, of course, and we're going to study that probably next Sabbath, get a little more deeper into it, but it had a dramatic effect on the Seventh-day Adventist church and changed our church uh, dramatically. But I want you to uh, recognize how Mrs. White replies to this. Now, th this, th their argument is that Christ could not have our fallen nature for he would have had to sin. That's evangelicals. And some Adventists believe that. I want you to look now how Mrs. White responds to this. Number one, if he did not have man's nature, he could not be our example. Jesus did not come to show us what God can do. Jesus came to show us what a man can do, controlled by God. Now, the first and primary reason why Jesus came was to be our Savior, our Redeemer. But he was also our example. And he also came to show us the true nature of, of God the Father because Satan had so, slandered his character so bad that you got two-thirds of Christianity believe that, that when a person dies, if you don't go to heaven, you go to hell and God burns you forever. And, of course, we as Adventists know that's not true. Another response is, number two, if he was not a partaker of our nature, he could not have been tempted as man had been tempted. Well, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity, but was in all points, not some points, not even most, all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. And then the third response he gives, If it were possible for him to yield a temptation, he could not be our helper. It was a solemn reality that Christ came to fight the battle as man in man's behalf. The emphasis there is mine because of the new theology that came into Adventism, this vicarious substitution that Jesus died instead of me. He came in instead when he had to come as us. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45, he had to become that second Adam to save us. That's the only way God could save us. His temptation and victory tells us that humanity must copy the pattern. Man must become a partaker of the divine nature, not an option. We have to experience that born-again experience that Jesus told Nicodemus about. This is one of my favorite statements from Desire of Ages. Now, I, I know and realize that Desire of Ages was written 10 years after 1888 and 1898. But Week, as we get, when we get into the changes that happened because of Walter Martin and the Adventist Church, I want you to remember this quote. In fact, remember her response that, that we just read. Desire of Ages. It would have been almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God uh, to take man's nature even where Adam stood in his innocence in Eden. Even if Jesus would have came and took Adam's pre-fallen nature before he sinned, that would have been infinite humiliation. But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the result of the working of the great law of hereditary. Jesus had to take our same fallen nature. The precious promises, 2 Peter 1.4 Whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these promises we can become partakers of divine nature. So we are, we have these exceeding precious promises in the Word of God. And it is through the Word of God that we become partakers of the divine nature of God. So as Jones and Wagner are up building their case, their whole theology on Jesus had to have the fallen nature he, to be our example, to be our Savior. He had to become one with us, uh, especially today and in the 1950s uh, when we, we capitulated, we changed our position on that. This is, this is monument in the church, and this is very important. We're going to have a little Greek study now because I want to demonstrate how important this is. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 2 and 3, and this is the King James, of course, it says, Hereby know ye that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh, that's the vine word, or the key word we're going to look at, is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, wherefore you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. What I did, I have on my Bible some software, 
And this is it. And you can see on the bottom down here. Now, i got a light here. I don't know if you're going to be able to. Yeah, it's, oh, the, Kenny's right. It doesn't show up on the screen. But on the bottom, it's a strong talking Greek and Hebrew dictionary is all it is. And I really appreciate the talking part because I look at some of those words and I would never get the pronunciation out of them. But the vine word up there, if you see that, is, uh, right, flesh. And the Greek word for flesh is sarx. You see that way up on top in the blue, S-A-R-X? It's used 151 times in the New Testament, 147 times as flesh, two times as carnal, one time as carnally minded, and one time as fleshly. And it's derived from the, uh, the Greek word, the root word, saru, which means flesh, the physical. But look at the red, because this is the part that's important. By implication, human nature, with its frailties, physical or morals, and its passions, especially a human being, carnal, carnally, carnally minded, plus fleshly. So the word sarts then always means sinful flesh. Uh, and if you go back, to our scripture reading in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 2 and 3, hereby we know the Spirit of God if we say that Jesus has come, and that word flesh there is sarx in the Greek, fallen flesh, sinful flesh. And he that says that he did not have our fallen flesh is of Antichrist. And this is important to remember. I'm setting a foundation for next Sabbath and how that change came into the Adventist church. Let me just give you a few more examples of where this word sarx is used. In Romans chapter three, uh, chapter 8 and verse 3, for what the law could not do, and what can't the law do? Can't save you. Never could. That's not why God gave the law. For what the law could not do, and there's nothing wrong with the law. Romans chapter 7 and verse 12 says the commandments are holy, just, and good. The law is not the problem. For what the law could not do, and is weak through the flesh, Whose flesh is Paul talking about there? Our flesh, right? That Greek word is sarx, sinful flesh. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak in the flesh, our flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness, not unlikeness, in the likeness of sinful, harmatia in the Greek, flesh, sarx. Same kind of flesh you and I have. And for sin, he met sin in his flesh, and he condemned sin in the flesh. So, in other words, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 2, the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ, and the law of sin and death, these two laws, and what is a law? They're a constant force. They never change, never deviate. These two laws met in the humanity of Christ, the same kind of flesh you and I have, and Jesus overcame sin in that flesh. And Jones and Wagner were very careful and, and insistent that we never drag his mind into this. He took our sinful fallen flesh, but he had a mind that was controlled completely and totally by the Holy Spirit. And that's the same Holy Spirit that God offers to you and me. Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. What gave Jesus the victory in the wilderness experience and all through his, his ministry was the Holy Spirit. Until he went into Gethsemane, of course, the Holy Spirit and the Father withdrew. He could not feel them, but they were still there. So it was his dependent. That's why he's an example for us. It's his dependent on the Holy Spirit, totally and completely, as we should be. So that way, he's our example. Just one more example of how this word is used in flesh. The same, same chapter, in Romans chapter 8, and verse 7. It says, for the carnal mind, that word carnal in Greek is sarts. This, the the, the sarx is the fallen flesh or the, the sinful flesh. For the carnal mind is enmity. Not only does it have this hostility, this hatred towards God, it is by its very design, its very makeup, it has this hostility towards God. It's not subject to God's laws and indeed never can be. And that's why Paul writes in verse 8 in Romans 8, those that are in the flesh in sarx can never please God. You can't get there from here. There must be that change. And that is the change of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Okay? Archie Nash. Archie Nash was a delegate to the 1888 General Conference. And I want to show you what he has to say. When Christ was lifted up as the only hope of the church and of all men, the speakers met in united opposition from nearly all the senior ministers. 
They tried to put a stop to this teaching by Elder Wagner and Jones. Do you understand what they're saying there? When Jones and Wagner stood up and presented Christ as the only hope to the church and the whole world, Seventh-day Adventist ministers are trying to shut them up. Whoa. What did I do here? This, these are ministers, that, and, and this is why Mrs. White had such an issue with these guys. And if you, and I hope you, <laughs> I'm trying to build a fire under your folks that you do read this book, Return of the Latter Rain. In fact, Jay Gallimore, did you ever hear, anybody know who he is? He was the president of the Michigan Conference up until January. He brought Ron Duffelfield in just before he retired. And Ron Duffelfield put on a seminar and Pastor Dan Tower, who was an evangelist for the Michigan Conference, uh, he just retired. Dan Tower was a uh, pastor that baptized Karen and I into the Adventist Church back in 1979. And I got to see Dan at camp meeting just, what, two weeks ago or through whatever it was. Uh, he's retired now, and he was there. And I haven't seen Dan for 35 years. And I asked him about this book. And he told me uh, it's an excellent book. And Every Seventh-day Adventist should read it. So if you're serious about being an Adventist, you should really under read this book. You really understand our history. But that's what, that what was going on in 1888 at the General Conference. Mrs. White knew these guys, these two guys, had a message right from Jesus himself, and most Seventh-day Adventist ministers were trying to shut them up. And just to show you that this isn't an isolated case, as I said, in 1979, Karen and I were baptized by Pastor Tower. And Dan gave us the book, Tell It to the World, a book written by Marvin Maxwell, who was a church historian at that time. And, of course, there's a whole chapter on 1888. You cannot study Adventist history without studying about the Minneapolis because it changed the church forever. And this is what it says. Many had lost sight of Jesus. Ellen White wrote later, for years the church had been looking to man but not looking to Jesus. And that is still a huge problem even in God's church today. Wagner, however, in connection with what he had said about the law, I had a great deal to say about Jesus. Many in the audience felt that he said too much about him, so Wagner's emphasis on Jesus in relationship to the law was unfamiliar, arising, arousing suspicion. All Jones and Wagner did, and this is the bottom line, after all the dust settles and all the mud's done being flung, the only thing Jones and Wagner really did is they came and put Christ back in the law. That's all. The emphasis before that was always on the law, the law, the law, the commandments. Jones and Wagner who had a message from Jesus himself, according to Mrs. White. For those of you who accept Mrs. White as a true prophet, and I do, they had a, a, a message from Christ himself, and the emphasis had to be put back on Jesus. And when they tried to do that, the leadership in the Adventist church tried to shut them up. So this is... It's serious because it's going. there is no statute of limitation for sin or for truth. Truth has no special time of itself. Its time is now always. So we can't say, well, that was, back, that was 130 years ago. That was back in 1888. The issue, as we're going to see, is still the same within the Adventist church. And this is serious stuff, I think. In fact, in the third part, which is two weeks from now, we'll look at, at the shaking in and the great tribulation and how this all comes into play. But this message, return of the latter rain, is the message that God has sent to his church. And the church as a whole has rejected it. Well, here's a letter. This is from the 1888 material. I can never forget the experience which we had at Minneapolis. Or the spirit that controlled men. They were moved at the meeting by another spirit. And they knew not that God had sent these young men, Elder Jones and Wagner, to bear a special message to them, which they treated with ridicule and contempt, not realizing that the heavenly intelligences, who's that? The angels, right? The heavenly intelligences were looking upon them and registering their words in the books of heaven. I know at that time that the Spirit of God was insulted. According to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31, what is the only unforgivable sin? Rejection of the Holy Spirit. That's what they were doing. That's how serious this is. They were rejecting the Holy Spirit. 
And once you reject the Holy Spirit, God has no other avenue, no other means to reach you. That's his chosen. The Holy Spirit is the communicator, the convictor. And once you reject him, you're on the road to perdition. That's what was going on here. Uh, here's another statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. In rejecting the message given at Minneapolis, men committed sin. So she defines this as sin. They have committed far greater sin by retaining for years the same hatred against God's messenger by rejecting the truth that the Holy Spirit had been urging home. Whose message was it? The message of the Holy Spirit, from the Holy Spirit. And our leadership was rejecting that. She writes in 1896, All the universe of heaven witnessed the disgraceful treatment of Jesus Christ Represented by the Holy Spirit, had Christ been before them, they would have treated him in a manner similar to that in which the Jews treated Christ. She's talking about Seventh-day Adventists and how we treated the message that God himself sent. Messenger from God. Now, you know the Greek word for angel is engelos, and it means either messenger or message, depending where the emphasis is put on. For instance, in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them on the earth. There the angel is symbolic because the emphasis is put on the message. By the way, who's supposed to be given that message? We are. But in this case, a message, an angel came to Ellen White. And I want you to understand what the angel told her because this is pretty, I think, pretty bloody important. The messenger plainly told Ellen White, Satan had blinded their eyes and perverted their judgment. The Lord revealed to Ellen White was, what was taking place at Minneapolis, and she was reminded by God of at least eight other events in the history of the world to which a comparison couldn't be made. Now, this is the angel talking to Ellen White. And, she, and he gave eight different uh, events in world history for what you can compare what was going on at Minneapolis. I'm only going to share three with you. If you want to know what the rest are, you're going to have to read the book. The first one here, when I proposed to leave Minneapolis, I don't know how many of you were at camp meeting, not the one just passed, but last year when Peter Neary, were you there? Well, he had an excellent study on the shakening, you know. Peter brought this up, and what's going on here, just to give you a little background, after the very first day that Ellen White was in Minneapolis, the very first day, she recognized the spirit that was going on. She seen how Satan was involved with taking control of these guys. She got so fed up and so disgusted, she was going to leave. She started packing her clothes, and then an angel came in her room. And this is what the angel said. When I proposed to leave Minneapolis, the angel of the Lord stood by me and said, Not so. God has a work for you to do in this place. The people are acting over the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abimeram. I have placed you in proper position. My grace and power shall sustain you. So here the angel was comparing what's going on at Minneapolis to the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abimeram. You remember that in, in, in Numbers chapter 16. It's the whole chapter. You remember what was going on? These guys, Korah, and Dathan, and Abimeram, were saying, accusing that, that Moses was no longer God's messenger, that Moses was just doing things on his own, that, that he had broken away from God, and it wasn't, it wasn't God controlling him. And even after God moved in, stepped in, and gave proof positive that Moses is my spokesman, he's my messenger, they still re uh, refused to, to receive that. Do you know what happened? You remember what happened? The earth opened up, and swallow them and cover them back over. Now, at least you think that this God we have, we serve as, a, as an exact hard God. He's not. Uh, if you remember a study I had a long time ago, Light on the Dark Side of God, in Patriarchs and Prophets, we're told that these three guys, God had given them proof positive. They still refused to accept it. They shut off all channels of the Holy Spirit. There was no way God could reach them anymore, so judgment happened. It was judgment in miniature. It's like there's going to be a judgment at the end of the world, at the end of time. God could not allow these guys to continue to affect his church and his truth. 
And since they refused, the judgment took place. But the angels were there registering their words in the books of heaven. Just like they were at Minneapolis registering the words in the books of heaven. Uh, another example is in Belshazzar's palace. The angels were there registering their, his words in the books of heaven. You all know what happened. You know, Nebuchadnezzar raided uh, Jerusalem, took a bunch of prisoners, took back the, the utensils from Solomon's temple, from the sanctuary. Nebuchadnezzar never profaned them, never used them, but Belshazzar, his grandson, was Cyrus the Great and the Medo-Persian army camped right outside the gate. He had a, a, a party. He invited a thousand guests to the palace, and he took the chalice and he drank from it. And the implication is, our God, the God of the Babylonians, Marmaduke, is much stronger than the God of Hebrew of the Hebrews, Yahweh. And you know what happened? The handwriting on the wall, mini mini telka euphrasin. Judgment happened that night, but the angels were there registering his words in the books in heaven. And the other one, of course, is when the Jews rejected Christ himself. The angels were there registering all the words for in the judgment, in the books. The angels were in Minneapolis 130 years ago registering their words. And if you really start reading uh, this book and get into an in-depth study, you find out just how tragic this was and how important this was and how important it is to us today. Said my guide, this is written in the book as against Christ. And time and time again, Mrs. White says, by rejecting these two guys, you're rejecting Christ. The real issue was the plan of salvation. It wasn't the law in Galatians. It wasn't the humanity of Christ. They were more distraction. The real issue was the plan of salvation itself, the gospel. And Satan had, and the spirit of prophecy tells us was really attacking it. And he really had a hold on some of our leaders. This is from L.D. Froome's book, Moving of Destiny. Of course, Dr. Froome is one of our church historians, one of our church leaders. We're going to talk a lot more about him next Sabbath. It's, but in his book, he writes, Butler believed, and G.I. Butler, of course, was General Conference president at that time. Butler believed that an overemphasis on the gospel threatened the law while Wagner believed that both the law and the gospel were threatened by this legalistic approach. As one of the delegates put it, the issue was righteousness by faith versus righteousness by works. That is the issue. That was the issue in 1888 at the General Conference session. That was the issue in 1955 when Dr. Walter Morton met with our church leaders. And that is the issue today in the Adventist church. Somehow we have married together this, this belief, and I, it's, to me it's heresy, that we are saved by grace plus our obedience to God's commandments. And as we studied, and, I, and we'll study this next week again, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 3, if you're looking to yourself and your obedience to God's commandments, even the thickness of a piece of paper, you're lost. God will re, re, uh, reject that. You have fallen from grace. You have severed your connection with Christ. Galatians chapter th- uh, 5 and verse 3. If you have a Bible commentary, read it sometime. It's pretty bloody scary. If you're looking to yourself at all and you're obedient. Our obedience to God's Ten Commandments law is never the means of our salvation. It's the result of our salvation we already have in Christ. But too many Seventh-day Adventists, and there's a lot of ministries within the Adventist church that teach that and promote that, we're going to look at two of them next Sabbath, two that I've had experience with, that we are saved by grace, certainly by the cross of Christ, but also by our obedience to God's commandments. You're making yourself co-redeemer with Christ, and that is blasphemy. God does not need your help in saving you. He has already saved you 2,000 years ago when he cried on the cross. It was finished. It was done. His sacrifice was perfect and complete. And by us thinking that now our obedience to God's commandments help and aid in our salvation, you might as well slap Christ in the face. And God, Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 20, God's going to reject that. He has to. It's by grace and grace alone. So this is, this is a real serious issue and it's going on in the Adventist church today. It's almost a culture to me in the Adventist church. Uh, and I, the Value Genesis uh, survey 
in the late 80s, early 90s, proved that out, when over 13,000 of our young people in our school systems were surveyed from the lower grades right through university level, 70% never had insurance of salvation, and 83% believe their standing before God is contingent on performance behavior. That's salvation by works. And in 2008, Pastor Lee Venden, I don't know if any of you, the son of Morris Venden, he said another survey was done, very similar to the value of Genesis, and that 82% or 83 went up to 88%. So instead of getting better, it's getting worse, and they're getting it from us. That's why our focus has to be on Jesus. So that's the issue today. It was an issue then, and it has always been the issue in the Adventist church. So we're going to fast forward a little bit now, about 70, 75 years. Uh, we're going to bring it a little closer up into the 1950s, because I want you to see how this thing developed and how it it, it prospered and growed within the Adventist church. Ellie Froome was introduced to Dono and Gary Barnhausen, a Presbyterian pastor and editor of Eternity, Eternity of Philadelphia. I could have did a better job of making this up. Donald Barnhausen, Dr. Donald Barnhausen is the pastor. Gary Barnhausen was his son. But Donald Bar, uh, Barnhausen was a Presbyterian pastor and editor of Eternity Magazine, which is one of their evangelical publications. I don't believe it's any longer in publication. But at the same time, Ellie Froome was also introduced to Walter Martin, a Baptist theologian who was eager for information about Adventists so he could wrap up his books. Now, he's writing two books at the time, Kingdom of the Cults and The Truth About Seventh-day Adventists. Walter Martin was in Nairobi, Kenya, um, 1979, and he was there to promote his book, Kingdom of the Cults. And it was at the same time that uh, one of our pastors, Pastor Jack Sequera, who was the uh, ministry secretary of the Eastern African Division at that time. And so he heard that Walter Martin was going to be there, so he went to that meeting. He wanted to hear what Walter Martin had to say. And at the end of that meeting, there was a question and answer time and this Baptist lady stood up and said, Dr. Martin, I heard you talk about the Christian science people. I heard you talk about Jehovah Witnesses. I heard you talk about Mormons. I heard you talk about the New Age movement. But I did not hear you talk about Seventh-day Adventists. And Dr. Martin says, well, I don't believe Seventh-day Adventists are a cult, although they do have some peculiar beliefs. After the question and answer period, Pastor Sequera went up and introduced himself as a pastor from that church with peculiar beliefs, as an Adventist pastor. And Jack said he was actually shocked at the knowledge that that man had on Ellen White. Of course, you know, as he studied Adventism to find out if we are a cult, he had to read a lot of Mrs. White's writings. And he said something to Jack that I believe is an accurate and true statement. He said, if Mrs. White was alive today, she would be horrified on how you people are using her. In 1981, Dr. Froome, Ellie Froome, invited Dr. Martin to a Bible conference in Cleveland, Ohio. It was a five-day conference, but Dr. M uh, Martin only lasted three days. And after the third day, he said to Ellie Froome, he said, why did you call this a Bible conference? Why didn't you call it an Ellen White conference? Because all our speakers quoted more from the spirit of prophecy than from Scripture. Do you know what Mrs. White herself said about how to use her writing? Uh, you all know who HMS Richard was, I assume. I think he's one of the greatest preachers this church has ever produced. His father was a Seventh-day Adventist minister. And he said to Mrs. White once, he says, when is it proper to use your testimonies from the pulpit? In those days, he never called it her writings. It was always her testimonies. And this is how she replied to him. She said, when the Lord has given you a topic to talk on, to speak on, and after you exhausted from Scripture, absolutely everything you can get from Genesis to Revelation on that topic, once you have gleaned everything out of Scripture, 
then and only then, if you think it's reasonable or if you want to use my testimony, then you can use it. But only after the Bible has been completely exhausted. Now, I don't do that. I get a quote that I, <laughs> Mrs. White, I use it without exhausting uh, going through the Bible. So we all have a lot to learn about that. But I believe she's a wonderful gift to the church, but we certainly have overused her and over abused her in the church. Uh, by the way, Walter Martin went to, he died at 60 years old, young man. He had a heart problem. He went to Weimar Institute, which is one of our institutes. And they put him on a very restricted diet, of course. It's all free, oil free diet. And any time he was asked, how's the food at Weimar, he always described it as the abomination of desolation. But some say that he got a couple extra years of life by going there. So, But that's neither here nor there. I thought I'd just share with that with you. But at any rate, uh, Dr. Froome met with Walter Martin in January of 1955, by the way. Now, you've got to understand a little bit of background. Walter Martin already believed we were a cult. And he wanted to put us in his book, Kingdom of the Cults, that way. It was Donald Barnhausen who said, they may be, but you at least owe those people a visit. You can't just say they're in a cult and you go and talk to them and find out truly what they believe. Do you know the number one criteria that they use to find out if a, a religious group is in a cult? Whether they have a teaching that cannot be proven from Scripture. There's other things, but that's number one. We as Seventh-day Adventists, we can prove all our doctrine from Scripture. So that's why he didn't put us in his book, uh, Kingdom of the Cults, even though he thinks we got some peculiar teachings. Walter Martin, a Baptist basically, questions covered a wide range of Adventist theology, including the sanctuary, 1844, the inspiration of Ellen White. The sanctuary, uh, the sanctuary like the investigative judgment, and we studied that what, a couple weeks ago, I guess here, a month. It's a beautiful doctrine, rightfully understood. The sanctuary is an absolutely beautiful doctrine. But the position that evangelicals take, and Walter Martin was no exception, is that how many of you heard of John Nelson Darby? Anybody? John Nelson Darby was an Irish, Irishman. Uh, he was a pastor. He came up with this dispensationalism. I'm sure you all heard of that. Uh, in the late early 19th century, 1830 to 1850s. He is, in fact, he's known as the father of dispensationalism. And dispensationalism is, he defined as that God deals with different people in different ways at different times. In other words, the Jews were under the dispensation of the law. They were saved by their obedience to the law. And the Sabbath was given to the Jews. How many here seen the discussion that Doug Batchelor had with uh, Steve Gregg on the Sabbath. Anybody? Nobody? Oh, you people watch too much TV. Steve, I don't know what position Steve Gregg is. Or, uh, obviously, he must be a minister of another denomination. It was there on, uh, on the Hope Channel, I believe. And I thought Doug Batchelor did an excellent job in explaining our position on the Sabbath. He did a beautiful job. But Steve Gregg took the position that the Sabbath was given to the Jews. It's not for us. And that is a typical position that evangelicals will always take. Uh, the Sabbath was given to the Jews. They're under the old dispensation, the dispensation of the law. The Old Testament was written for them. And we as Seventh-day Adventists would do well to leave the sanctuary and the Sabbath in the Old Testament. The relics from the Old Testament. That's their belief. Their belief is, and on the new dispensation that Darby came up with, that since the cross, we Christians are under the dispensation of grace, we're saved by grace, and of course, you and I know we have always been saved by grace from day one, that Adam sin. But we're under grace now, the New Testament's written for us, and we're no longer under this dispensation of the law. And I've been told many times by my evangelical friends, Jay, we're no longer under the law, we're under grace. And of course, that's Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. But that's the two dis dispositions that are very popular in, even in Christianity today. Along with that, Darby also latched on to futurism. Anybody know what that is? There's three methods for studying, especially 
uh, prophecy in the apocalyptic books of Daniel and Revelation. There's a predecessor, there's a futurist, and then there's a historic. We as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe in the historic position. Some things have happened, and some things have yet to happen. How this came about in the 16th century when all the reformers were pointing to the Church of Rome as the Antichrist of Revelation 13, of course the Catholic Church wasn't going to take that sitting down. They went to the very best. Two Spaniards, two both Jesuit priests, one by the name of Elcazar, and he came up with this position that everything happened in the past. We can't be the Antichrist. Everything was done in the past. Uh, and, and Daniel and Revelation, that's talking about the past, which is still, by the way, the, the position of the Catholic Church. And they defined the Antichrist as Nero. And Nero was a beast. There's no, in fact, even defined it down more to a man, uh, a Roman general by the name of Antioch Epiphanes. Anybody ever hear him? Yeah. Antioch Epiphanes took and he sacrificed a pig in the Jewish sanctuary, which would be blasphemy to a Jew and would be to us as an Adventist. But so Elkazar came up with this theology that we can't be the Antichrist. Everything happened in the past. Alberto Ribera, another Spaniard, Jesuit priest, he went in a different direction. He said, and he did something very interesting. He took the last week of the 70-week prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, you know, where the Messiah, the prince, will be cut off, but not for himself, for the sins of his people. And three and a half years later was the stoning of Stephen. That's what we as Seventh-day Adventists believe. And I believe that's the accurate. He took that last week and ripped it off from the 70-week 70 70 prophecy, and he shot it way out in the future. And he came up with this, that the church will be raptured away and then the Antichrist will make peace with Israel for three and a half years and three and a half years later he'll turn on them and that's the tribulation. Well, Darby bought into that futurism theology and it, really, it didn't really spread a whole lot into a man by the name of Cyrus Schofield. Anybody ever hear the Schofield Bible? You had to. I mean, if, if you talk to the Baptists. Cyrus Schofield took this Darby dispensationalism, futurism theology, and he put it in the Bible, almost like our Andrew Study Bible. It's the King James Bible, but all the footnotes are this dispensationalism and futurism uh, theology. Well, that's why Walter Martin, when he first seen this on the sanctuary, he th that belongs to the Jews. Those three areas... The Sanctuary, 1844, and the inspiration of Ellen White. And I could talk long on that, on, but I'm not going to. We're going to move on here. Uh, so he believed that, but those are those peculiar beliefs. He was able to live with those. But there were four areas that stuck out in Walter Martin's mind that he could not live with. And he had, we had to come to terms with that. And we're going to find out next Sabbath that we capitulated. We changed our position. And it set us back in the wilderness for more than 40 years, another 130 years. Uh, in the autumn of 1957, the Adventist leadership published the book Questions on Doctrine. The full title is Seventh-day Adventist Answer Questions on Doctrine because this group was questioning our doctrine. And we're going to stop at this one here. Uh, two of them I agree with, Walter Martin on, and two of them I do not. The first one, that salvation is a result of grace plus works of the law. We are saved by grace, period. It's all of Christ. And our obedience to God's law is only the proof or the evidence. But like I said, it's a culture within the Adventist church. And there's a lot of studies have proven that out, unfortunately. We'll look at that next Sabbath. We're going to go in depth. We're going to look at two ministries that promote that, that we are saved by grace plus our work. And they're very active within the Adventist church today. Uh, the next question, and I thought by 1955 we would have all our ducks in a row, that the Lord Jesus was a created being and not from eternity. You know, to me, I, I was surprised to see that. Uh, but evidently, we're going to talk about the Trinity, and the Trinity is still under attack, by the way, even within the Adventist church today. The next two I do not agree at all with Walter Martin on it that the atonement of Christ was not complete upon the cross. 
You're not, uh, you try to tell that to the evangelical, he's going to laugh in your face. I hope you understand why we don't believe that. And we're going to look at a, a, a particular uh, a drawing of the sanctuary. This, and this is sanctuary doctrine. It's important that as we as Seventh-day Adventists understand that. And if Walter Martin accepted and understood the sanctuary, this would not be an issue. And the last one, and this is one we're going to spend the most time on because this became the hottest issue, that he partook of man's sinful nature at the Incarnation. As we read before, they believe that if Jesus had the same fallen nature that we had, he would have had the sin. And we know that's not true. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So we're going to take next Sabbath each one of these points and look at them in depth and continue. And then we're going to talk about Desmond Ford and Robert Brinsmead. Those people were self and do We created those problems. They were self and those problems because back in the 50s we capitulated we changed our theology, and it's affecting all Adventists even today. So that's why this message of Christ and his righteousness is so important to us, that we completely and totally understand it. We are saved totally by Christ and his works of righteousness, nothing by that we have.